The Lord be with you. Happy New Year. We're glad to see you all here. Um, and those of you watching us online from near and far, welcome as well. And we welcome all of our guests and visitors, and we're just happy to be able to worship together today. Next Sunday, we go back to our corners. So the 845 service will happen at 845 and we'll be in the chapel. And this service will be at 11. So don't come at 1030 next week. I think that's it. So let's prepare ourselves to worship God. Well, if you are able, let us stand and let us join together in the call to worship. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. For thus saith the Lord, proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. Let us worship God and let us pray together. It is it's good to sing you our praises, O God, for you are gracious and the song of praise is fitting. You heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. You determine the number of stars and give them their names. Your greatness abounds and your understanding is beyond measure. We will sing to you hymns of thanksgiving and make melody with songs of praise as you take pleasure in those who hope in your steadfast love. Be pleased with our worship as we lift our voices in glad adoration. Amen.
us continue our prayers and confess our sins. Gracious God, you chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. Yet we do not love our brothers and sisters as he taught. You destined us for adoption as your children through Jesus Christ. Yet we take our status for granted and fail to obey Christ when he calls us to follow. With all wisdom and insight, you have made known to us the mystery of your will. Yet we stubbornly refuse to study your word. Forgive our sin, O God, and help us set our hope on Christ, that we may live for the praise of his glory. Jesus Christ was born to save, and indeed, in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Good morning and Happy New Year. So, after lunch today, 
I will begin the process of putting up all the Christmas decorations. I know some of you might leave them out for a little bit longer, but for me, I like a good fresh start for the new year. But I must admit, it's kind of sad putting away all those Christmas lights because they provide just this warm, cozy glow during the month of December. And I kind of miss that when I put them away. And light's really important this time of year because it's the darkest time of the year. But one of light's best qualities is the fact that it removes darkness, removes it entirely. And a good example of this is if you've ever been to a cave, you took a tour of a cave, and typically the, the tour guide will say, now we're going to show you how dark it gets inside the cave. So they gather you together real close and they say, don't move, we're going to turn out all the lights. And they do, and when they do, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. It's so dark. But then, little by little, the tour guide will then start turning a flashlight back on or light a candle or something like that. And it was always amazing to me as a kid that even the tiniest bit of light would remove the darkness all the way even to the far back wall of the cave. You could still see all the way back with just that little bit of light. Now, there may be times when we've experienced dark or sad times in our lives. And we will have them. That's just part of life. But the good news is that since we follow Jesus, that darkness will never truly overcome us. Because as we've learned before, that one of the many names that Jesus is called by, he's called the light of the world, right? He came into the world to remove that evil or that darkness. So whenever it's you have a bad time, just remember that, that you've got the light of the world on your side. And one thing I've always loved about Christmas, especially Christmas Eve, is when we light our candles together and we sing Silent Night. And the cool thing is, is that that first candle that's lit is lit using the Christ candle. So we are literally sharing Christ's light with one another. And as each candle gets lit, the room gets a little bit brighter and the darkness goes away. Now imagine for me, if you will, if we were to go out and we were to share Christ's light like we do when we light our candles with one another, think of how much brighter the world could be. Because as we know, it's a little dark right now. So as you go throughout this week and you head back to school, I want you to think of ways that you can share Christ's light with others so that we can maybe make this dark world a little bit brighter by sharing his light okay so if you're going to blast today you're gonna come um, with me I'm gonna take you down there Leanna is waiting for you but before then let's say our prayer together all right let us pray repeat after me dear God help us to share your light with the world amen We read first this morning from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. 
In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. And we read from John 1, 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is, God's, it is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. The word of the Lord. Well, so that is that. Now we must dismantle the tree, putting the decorations back into their cardboard boxes, and some have got broken, carrying them up to the attic. The holly and the mistletoe must be taken down and burnt, and the children got ready for school. There are enough leftovers to do warmed up for the rest of the week. Not that we had that much appetite, having drunk such a lot, stayed up so late, and attempted quite unsuccessfully to love all of our relatives. And in general, grossly overestimated our power. So says W.H. Auden toward the end of his long poem, For the Time Being, which is a retelling of the Christmas story. And in the passage where I took this piece, he captures perfectly the sense of Christmas is over. The magic and mystery of that night gives way to the gray, pale winter daylight and our ordinary routine. And he says that for those who have glimpsed the Christ child, the time being is the most trying time of all. Don't you think he has it right? I mean, Christmas is beautiful. And tied up with it are so many traditions and customs and family habits, so many memories and so much emotion. And we wish we could keep that going all year long, but we can't. And the contrast when things get back to normal 
Auden again. The streets are much narrower than we remembered. We'd forgotten the office was as depressing as this. But what if it could be different? Not that we could maintain the emotions of Christmas all year long, but that we could continue being aware of something or someone other. What if we could keep that glimpse of the Christ child all year long? Now we have this curious statement in the gospel reading, tucked away at the end. The word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. So the word, the word that was with God and was God, the the word through whom all things were created, that word became flesh, became human flesh, lived among us, and was full of grace and truth. The ancient Greeks thought this was ridiculous. Their word for word is logos, and it means the principle and the meaning that underlies things, sort of like the the mathematical formulas that we use to understand the world. So it would be strange for us to say algebra became meat. But that's how it sounded to the Greeks. That's why Paul says the gospel is so much foolishness to them. How can the divine become human? But that's just the preposterous claim the gospel makes. The divine becomes human. The word becomes flesh. God is one of us. A song from some years ago asked, what if God were one of us? What if God were one of us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home. I always liked that song. What if God were just a slob like one of us? Not to say that Jesus Christ is a slob, but to heartily affirm that Jesus Christ shared our earthly existence in every respect and knew the temptations to boredom and despair that we face every pale gray winter day. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be a stranger just trying to get home. But the incarnation didn't happen so that God could be educated and better informed. It was not that God said, hmm, I wonder what it's like to be one of them, to be like a slob on the bus. And so he entered the human world to find out. Jesus didn't come to share our world so that he would know our experience. We say that so often that we think maybe that's why he came. He came to inform us and educate us. We don't teach him what human life is about. He teaches us what human life is truly about, full of grace and truth. So in Jesus Christ, we find out how we're supposed to live it. There's the old joke about the guy who bought a chainsaw. He's very impressed with the claim that with the chainsaw, he could cut 10 cords of wood in a day. That's a lot of firewood. So he buys it. And he comes back a week later complaining that no matter how hard he tries, he can only cut one, maybe two cords of wood in a day. And the merchant says, well, let's take a look. Pulls the rope. The chainsaw roars to life. And the terrified customer screams, what's that noise? He'd been using the chainsaw to cut the wood without running the engine. 
So he was using the saw, but not the way it was intended, not fully taking advantage of what it could do. And human life is something like that. We are alive, but we're not really truly fully alive without Jesus Christ. Now we get this picture painted for us in all of its fullness in this first chapter of Ephesians. And one writer says that rather than put these words under a microscope, using the lens of our particular theology to explain, we should look at them as you look at the, the heavens on a moonless night, gazing with awe, wondering at the vastness convinced and convicted of your own finite infinitesimalness. They're that grand. In Ephesians, we have a long list of promises, a long list of verbs describing what God has done and does for us in Jesus Christ. Blessed us, made us holy and blameless, chose us, destined us, adopted us, bestowed grace on us, redeemed us, forgave us, lavished riches on us, made known to us the mysteries of his will, gathered us together in Christ. We've obtained an inheritance. We live for his praise. We're marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Each one of those could be a servant or two. Each one of those is worthy of prayer and meditation. We can't do all that today. But we can see the grand scale of God's goodness as we hear that list go on and on. So what if God were one of us? What would God do? Apparently, God would be endlessly gracious and giving, drawing us into his life in Jesus Christ, taking our humanity and healing it, restoring in us the image and likeness of God as originally intended. We see that God has had this plan in mind all along. Since the beginning, he chose us, destined us, called us in Jesus Christ. So God has always known us and wants us to be joined to him willingly and happily. So rather than grossly overestimating our powers, as Auden put it, we live joyfully in the power of God. Well, you might say the answer is, if God were one of us, being one of us would be much better. But it is. God does exactly that for each one of us. We come to worship and we're joined to Christ. We're fed by Christ. He enables us to grow in grace and we become more aware of the mysteries, the gifts that he give us. So we're made more able to know and love God, to see the work of God in our lives every day, each day. And so we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So then who is Jesus? He's a promise for the prophets. He's he's a problem for Joseph. He's a savior for the shepherds, a threat for King Herod, a memory for Mary, and most of all, including all of those, he's the son of God. He's the one who comes and brings all of these blessings to us. And words can barely express these blessings, naming them but never exhausting what they mean for us. So then, let's go forward into the new year. And people share wishes always that somehow this year will be better and brighter than last year. Hoping that somehow life will rise above the pale winter grayness we see every morning. And here in Ephesians, here in the gospel, we have God's promise that it will. 
because of what God has already done in Jesus Christ. We are loved and we are redeemed. Thanks be to God. affirm our faith and use the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, 
true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, he proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. So we gather for prayer today and we remember Peyton Nolly who had her knee rebuilt on December 23rd and she's recuperating well. Mitzi Moody who faces a second knee replacement on a different knee tomorrow. And we pray for Bill Insko and his family, including Joan's children and their families as we mourn her death for Joan died early yesterday morning. Funeral plans are still pending. We also pray for Tom Witherspoon, who was in the hospital dehydrated, and for the people in Boulder, Colorado, whose town is burnt down, for all the people who have great needs in this world, let us pray. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this new year. We give you thanks for your care which walks us through every time in every year. And we pray this year for peace among our people and an end to the COVID pandemic. Now we know there's precious little we can do to bring these outcomes, but we pray for the courage and strength for each of us to do what we can do. So we pray for healing and strength for Peyton and for Mitzi with their surgeries and give them courage and determination to work through the pain as they get stronger. We pray for Tom Witherspoon that you will continue to heal him and his battle for health. And we pray for Bill, for Rob and Vicki and Preston and Tyler for Lynette and Rayanne and Callie and Joseph. We pray for Joan's daughters and their families. Give them all peace, hope, and comfort as they face this new year without her. And receive her into the arms of your mercy and everlasting comfort, we pray. As we face our own new year, each of us has hopes and dreams and plans. We pray that you will guide us and bless us in these endeavors, that you'll bless what suits your will and frustrate what opposes it, no matter how good it may seem to us. Help us enter the new year thoughtful of who we are, mindful that our steps make an impact and our words carry power. And so, God, may we walk gently, and may we speak only after we've listened. Help us to enter the new year reverently, aware that you've endowed every creature and plant, every person and habitat with beauty and purpose. And may we regard the world with tenderness. May we honor rather than destroy. Lover of all souls, 
Help us to enter the new year joyfully, willing to laugh and dance and dream, remembering our many gifts with thanks and looking forward to the blessings to come. May we welcome your lavish love. And in this new year, may the grace and peace of Christ bless us today and in the days to come and hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So go in peace. And no matter what challenges life brings you or what tragedies meet you, know that God has a better idea and a better plan, and God's plans will not be overthrown. So go in peace, and may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you this day and every day forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.